Hello and welcome to Let's Code an Indie Game episode 20. This is the series where we learn the tools and techniques needed to get started with indie game development. In this episode, we're going to give our players something to do when a button gets pressed, but first, let's take a look at what we did last time. So if we just run our game, we can see that we now have these potions, and when we run into them, uh, we play a sound effect. So let's just take a look at the code that makes all of that happen, because we'll be reusing a lot of it in this episode. So. If we take a look at magicpotion.lua, um, we can see that our potion, if we go down to uh, magicpotion.create, our potion is actually an entity like um, everything else in our game that lives inside of a room um, or moves around. Uh, this entity doesn't move, but it does have a piece of collision code that says when the player collides with it, we play the uh, potion collection sound, um, and then we call self.done, and self.done we take a look inside of our entity, oops, inside of our entity, if we find our done method. See that self.done just sets finished to true, and that's important because inside of our room, where we update all of our entities at the moment, if anything um, is finished or if any entity has finished set to true, then we actually remove that entity from the room and from the game. Cool, so what are we going to do in this episode? Well, we need um, our player to be able to attack or to use items and interact with the game somehow, so we're going to start writing some code uh, to make something happen when a button gets pressed. But before we do that, we need to tidy up our main files slightly. So if we just come back into main.lua, we can see that at the moment we still create our player inside of the love.load function. Instead, it would be nice if we had a class to take care of that for us, uh, much like our slime class, which is responsible for making slimes. So let's go into our mobs folder, make a new file, and we'll call this file player.lua. So like all of the uh, modules in our game, we start by making an empty table and we make sure we return that table at the end of the module. And now we can attach a function to that table. So player.create. And then we can take a look at our main file and we can move a lot of the code um, to do with creating the player into our player module. So let's just take these two lines to start with. We can pull out our adventurous sprite so it just lives um, lives at the module level. Uh, it doesn't need to be inside of our create function. So we'll just go ahead, extract that. And we'll just tidy up this uh, function call here so we can see what's going on. And we also need to get hold of our keyboard movement method, which uh, oops, we don't have in this module yet. So we can pull that in using a requires or a require. Oops require and this was we can just check inside of main.lua let's see keyboard movement source logic AI movement keyboard movement there we go and we need to make sure that we actually return our player from our create method Okay, so now inside of our main function, we uh, should be able to go ahead and just, in fact, we can use it down here. We can just do player.create as long as we pull in our new player module. So local player equals require 
source mobs player. And this means we can actually get rid of a lot of these uh, requires as well. They weren't all used for creating the player. Some of them are left over from other places in the uh, or from previous episodes because we haven't been great about tidying up. But now is the time to fix that. So we can get rid of follow player. We can get rid of bounce. We can get rid of keyboard movement. And we can get rid of entity and sprite. There we go. That is uh, much neater. Let's uh, just see if anything works. No, attempt to index global sprite. Yes, of course. So inside of our player module, we do need to make sure we uh, pull in our sprite code as well. Require source graphics sprite. And, of, ah, and yes, of course, we also need our entity code. So we do need to uh, make sure we require all of the code we'll be using, source logic entity, I think. Great, we're back. And everything still works. So one of the reasons for uh, moving our player into its own module, other than just making the code, uh, making the code a bit neater, is we can now um, customize our player entity much more than the other entities in our game because we want our player entity to be able to perform actions when the um, when buttons get pressed. Uh, we don't want our other entities to be able to do that necessarily, so for now we're just pulling our player out into its own module. So now we can, while we have access to the player in the create function, we can add in some more functions, including, let's call it action one. So I'm imagining our player will eventually have one, two, or maybe three actions they can do. Um, so Let's call the first action, action one. And now up here we can create a function for that. Take self because it's an instance method, it's still on the instance of the player. And we'll also uh, take in the game as well. So we can uh, actually get a handle on what's going on. And for now, let's... Uh, Let's just do nothing, um, apart from a bit of wiring up. So the way we handle with keyboard inputs in Love or Love2D, one of the ways, so we've done this um, already in our keyboard movement. It might be worth looking at that quickly. So in our keyboard movement, we use love.keyboard is down. And this is one way of, um, of dealing with keyboard and input in Love2D. The other thing, uh, we can do is love dot key pressed, and what this will do is the love two D framework will call love dot key pressed every time a key gets pressed, and it will pass in which key this uh, or which key is pressed. So we're going to add a key pressed method to our game state class. Let's just add it here, key pressed, and this will also take the key uh, that gets pressed. And what we want to do is um, we need to make sure it's an instance method, so pass in self first. And then on self.player, because our game state contains our player, we can now call action one and make our player do something when a given key is pressed. So let's finally do an if key equals uh, z, then self dot player action one end. And we just need to make sure we add this to our game state. Um, object when it gets created. So instance.key pressed equals key pressed. There we go. And I'll just check inside our main.lua to, yep, we're using a colon there. So it does get called as an instance method. So let's run our game. And 
I can press the Z key, nothing is happening, but nothing is breaking. So that's uh, all good. Okay, so now let's think about what we want to happen when um, when our key gets pressed or when our player performs an action. And to start with, we're just going to spawn um, another entity, and this entity is going to represent sort of punching or throwing a punch into the air. So our player isn't currently carrying anything. Uh, so when characters are unequipped, let's just make them uh, do a bit of a punch or a jab. So let's make an entity to actually reflect that. So we'll make a new folder. And we'll call this folder, let's say, items. And inside of items, let's make a new file. And we'll call it punch.lua. Say local punch is equal to an empty table. We make sure we return our empty table. And then punch.create is a function. And the punch uh, or the instance of our punch object is actually going to be an entity. So entity.create. So we'll pull in our entity code equals require source dot logic dot entity and we know that our entities take an x y and a z position so let's just uh, pass those in as arguments into our punch.create method and let's remind ourselves what else our entity uh, create method takes if we look at entity.lua scroll down to create you can see it takes a sprite an x y and a z position speed movement and collision and we know that if um, movement or collision are empty or nil then um, our game actually ignores them so they are safe to leave out for now I'll just try and find an example of that here we go so we say if self.movement then update the movement so if movement doesn't exist we shouldn't do anything so we can ignore movement and collision, I believe, but we still need to do um, a sprite, an x, y, and z position, and a speed. So uh, let's say punch sprite equals, uh, so we'll also need our sprite class require source graphics sprite then for our punch sprite we can do sprite.create and I've gone ahead and made a very simple punch sprite uh, just before the episode punch.png which let's uh, zoom in it's actually very difficult to see because it's white and transparent, but you can just about see it there. Uh, that's what we'll use at least to start with. So load assets sprites punch.png. So then when we create our punch entity, we pass in the punch sprite, the x position oops, the Y position and the Z position. And of course we need to return it as well. Okay, so now inside of our player object, let's pull in our punch um, object or inside of our player module, let's uh, pull in our punch module. Just uh, getting the terminology right. Um, where did we put it? Source.items.punch. So punch isn't really an item, but it's uh, it's kind of an item. In the way that we're modeling things in the game, um, punch is just going to be another item. So we'll end up doing all of our items more or less like this, at least at the moment. I might change my mind, but for now, uh, this is what we'll do. So down here, we can start by doing punch.create.
and we can grab self.x, self.y, and self.z, and we probably want to add, we know that our player sprite is is I think 16 by 16 so let's add um, let's add 8 to the X position so the punch um, object appears in front of our player at least to start with. So now we actually need a way of adding our punch entity into the game so it can take part in the collisions and everything else that's going on. So to do this we need to take a look at our room class or our room module. Sorry room module which contains our room class. And so now, if we take a look, when we create a room, we create the room with a list of entities. Uh, but we don't currently have a way of adding an entity to our rooms, I don't think. Just having a quick look. So let's go ahead and make a method for doing that. Local add entity equals function. We do actually have a method for adding entities to our global game entities where our player lives, but we don't have anything for room level entities. And it kind of makes sense if the punch object uh, lives, at least to start with, lives in the room, not in the global game state object. So add entity is a function. It takes self because, again, it's an instance function. And then we'll pass in the entity we want to add and then we can do table.insert so um, Lua has a, a built-in method for adding to a table called table.insert and I think it takes um, the table so that will be self.entities and then the thing we want to insert which will be the entity So now when we go back to our player action one method, we know we've got the game, or we may not have the game, but we can fix that in a moment. We've got, we should have access to our game object. So now we can get hold of our current room. In fact, I'm fairly sure uh, we do this using our map method, um, our map um, class or map object inside of our game but again let's uh, let's check map.lua yep current room just gives us the current room so one nice thing here is we're starting to reuse a lot of our code and we're really starting to build things out of things we've built in previous episodes which feels pretty satisfying um, things need to change a lot more before we get to that uh, that sort of first playable demo or sort of pre-alpha release, but we're, we're getting there week by week. Slowly but surely. Okay, so we grab our current room, then we should be able to do current room, add entity, and we can pass in the entity which we create. And I just want to check our game state uh, key pressed method because we need to pass in the game as well because the second argument of action one is uh, is our game state so let's see what happens Aha, attempt to call method add entity a nil value so this probably means that in our room class I haven't added add entity and indeed I haven't to the um, instance when it's created. So let's add that method onto the instance and try again. Great, so now we can actually create uh, punch objects. They don't do anything, but uh, and they stay there forever, but those are things that we can, uh, we'll get around to fixing probably in the next episode. But just um, just for fun and to close this episode, down, let's use SFXer to add a punch sound to our um, to our game. So let's just open up 
So um, this is SFXer. It's a great tool for making sound effects really quickly. It has some really good sort of presets. Um, I might do an episode or maybe even a sidebar explaining a bit more about how sounds are generated in, um, in old school video games. But for now, we're just going to go over to the sidebar here. And um, let's go with the hit hurt sound. And every time you click these, it generates a new sort of random sound following the same profile. So let's uh, keep going until we get a nice punch sound. That feels pretty good. And then we can go down here to export wave. And let's just, uh, let's code an indie game episode. 20 assets sounds and let's just call this punch dot wave so i'll leave a link to sfxer in the readme for this episode which you can find or you can find a link to all of the code and all of the readme information at the bottom of the video uh, as always as always so finally inside of our player class, let's add our punch sound. Actually, we, yes, uh, no, sorry. This is the wrong place. Let's, um, instead, let's add the sound effect to the actual punch create method. It's generally better to keep things closer to, uh, closer to the most sensible place. And because eventually our player will be using different items, they won't just be punching. Um, we probably want to tie the sound to the punch of or to the punch entity's creation, not to the uh, not to the player performing an action. So just say punch sound equals, and let's just double check in our potion method for how um, how we load sounds. Oops, I've just tried to open a wave file, which uh, not a good idea. Let's try again. Potion magic potion .lua. There we go. So to load a file, we just do love.audio new source. New source, file name, assets, sounds, punch.png type. And because this is a small sound file, we can make it static, which means it will just load it straight into memory. It won't try and stream it or anything. And now when we uh, create our punch object, we can just say punch sound play. Okay, let's give it a go. Ooh, could not find, ah, punch, sorry, it is not a punch.png, it is a punch.wave. I am pretty tired this evening, so sorry for the, uh, I made a couple of just uh, errors where I've just said or typed uh, obviously the wrong thing, but never mind. Okay, assets, sprites, punch does not exist. Ah, yep, as I said, very tired this evening. Um, finding it hard to focus, but I'll probably uh, go to bed straight after this episode, so that's all good. Let's just have a quick uh, slow down, you know, chill out and uh, read what I'm actually doing. Good, that's a PNG, that's a wave. Run the game, throw some punches. Cool. Right, and we can see that, yep, our punches currently live at a room level, which means they just hang around in the room when we leave. And they currently uh, hang around forever and they don't do anything, but that's uh, the topic of the next episode. So I will stop here. Thank you for watching, I hope you're enjoying the series, and if you have a spare couple of seconds, please do like and or subscribe, it really does help me out a great deal. Thanks very much, and I will see you next time.